Here today to my left is Mr. Jeffrey Moore. He represents the city of Aurora. Adjacent to him is David Frank with the town of Erie. And last but not least, Jason Maxey with Weld County. What we've decided is each individual gentleman has a different topic to speak to within their local governments. So since the passing of Senate Bill 181, there's been a significant change in regulations. With the implementation of those regulations, they've each chosen a topic that's currently near and dear to their heart. With that, I'm gonna allow them each to present to you. We'd like to keep this interactive as much as possible. Of course, I can talk forever. I have tons of questions and I work in compliance. But I'm assuming coffee and ibuprofen has kicked in. And I want everyone to first turn around, give Kirby and all of his staff a big round of applause for the best conference. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Moore has the clicker, and he's going to start today with pl plugged wells. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Moore. I am the manager of the Energy and Environment Division for the city of Aurora. A big thanks to Kirby for allowing me to bring this topic to you here today. And um, the title is Plugged Wells, The Journey Continues. So imagine with me for a minute. The year is 1973. Now, before you say that was a long time ago, that was the year I was born. So it wasn't that long ago. Nevertheless, 1973, you drill a well a few miles outside the city limits. Unfortunately, it's dry, so you plug it and you move on. Fast forward 50 years ahead. You've got a developer that's coming in that now wants to put a, a residence or a commercial building near that plugged well or even right over the top of it. Is it a problem? Yes, it is. Well, let me explain why. We'll find some solutions together. First of all, some definitions. What's a plugged well? Well, a lot of things happen. Removing surface equipment, if there is any. Placing cement in certain portions of the casing. Cutting that casing off five feet below the surface. Uh, and reclaiming the surface. There are a couple of uh, codes that the COGCC uses uh, in terms of these plugged wells. DNA for dry and abandoned if there was no production, and PNA for plugged and abandoned uh, if, there, if there was production. Here's a picture of, of a plugged well that we found in the uh, city of Aurora recently. Now these codes are important because they tell us something about the history of the well, and that's gonna be important as you'll see later. Now let's kind of zoom out to the whole state. There's about 49,000 plugged wells in Colorado right now. About half of those are PNA, half of those are DNA. There's another more than 49,000 wells that are still open that will one day be plugged. If we think about that from the, uh, an annual perspective, since the Oil and Gas Commission was founded in 1951, we've been averaging about 500 wells per year uh, being plugged up until the last decade and the numbers have increased. We even have records of wells that were plugged even before the commission began. So what are some of the risks for those wells? Well, in the early industry, it was thought that plugging was the end of the story. But in today's world, we know that's not always the case. Um, older plugging doesn't always meet modern standards. The cement and steel casing deteriorate over time. Uh, the type and volume of cement used in the original plug, depth and temperature of the well, the salinity of the fluids in contact with the well bore, all those things can cause a deterioration. Now we see a different risk profile based on the different uh, type of well. So for a PNA well, the greatest risk we see is the slow leaking of hydrocarbons to the surface through the well bore itself. For a DNA well, it's downhole communication between the hydrocarbon zones and the freshwater zones. Many of those wells were left open whole uh, after they were plugged. And keep in mind that a dry well doesn't mean that there were no hydrocarbons encountered. It just means that there were no uh, uh, economic production available in that well. Here's an example from the city of Aurora. This is a well that was drilled uh, and dry and plugged in 1958. They used only 20 sacks of cement down to 163 feet. Um, and then it was open hole below that. Now, the base of the aquifers in this well, there are four aquifers, and uh, they go down to below 1,800 feet. So that whole section all the way down to TD was left open hole in this well. So that allows the produc potential production zone or the hydrocarbon bearing zone to be in communication with the aquifer. Now in 2023, Civitas Resources came back and replugged this well for us. They added an additional thousand sacks of cement. Uh, and you can clearly see in the wellboard diagram, they've got uh, cement through all the aquifer zones and in between the aquifers in the lower zone. So this well is now properly protected. So what are some of the risks uh, involved? We talked about you know, the different profiles and what could happen. We believe that all wells have the potential to be replugged in the future. Not all wells will be, of course. 
but you need to understand that there is that potential. We're using a value of about 25 to 50 years after the original plugging, with the caveat of understanding when that plugging actually occurred. There's also uh, Rule 308B7 in the COGCC rules that require uh, an offset operator, if you are drilling a horizontal well, you have to evaluate all the wells, including plugged wells, within 1,500 feet of that wellbore. If you can't get access to that wellbore, for example, to replug it, and it needs to be replugged, then um, you may not be able to drill that well, or at least not complete the whole uh, section of it. So let's say you, you've got a plugged well, you need to find it. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you look at all the paper data resources, anything you can find on the internet, maps, photos, COGCC records, you look at everything. That anything you can do on paper is gonna save you time and resources when you get out to the field. So the first thing you do is that you establish a, uh, the most likely location of the well and a search polygon. From there, you can use a, a magnetometer, either a ground-based unit or an aerial unit uh, via a drone, uh, to go out and do the work in the field. That may also help you find an abandoned flow line that you weren't aware of or other equipment. And then finally, the physical searching, digging in the ground. Now in Aurora, we use a, a search radius for looking for these old plugged wells uh, based on the, the spud date of the well. So for wells that were spud before 1951, before the commission began, a lot of those are only permitted on a quarter section basis. So COGCC puts that in their database to, to show us all the information. They, they code that with the information they have. But most likely, that well spot's gonna show up right in the middle of the quarter section. That means you've got about a 160 acre search window that you may have to look in to find that plugged well. From 1951 to the 70s, you can probably drop that down to about 40 acres. Uh, moving ahead, you know, probably 10 acres. And then after GPS uh, began to be used and, and reported in permit applications, um, you're probably down to tens of feet uh, in terms of what you might have to look for to find a plugged well. Now let me give you a really cool example from the city of Aurora on using all the data. This is a well, num the uh, Iman number one. It was spud in 1919. It was permitted in the northeast quarter of section 28. And right there in the center of the section, that's where the COGC records uh, showed that it was. We had a developer that came in that wanted to put some industrial buildings in this quarter section. They did their search exactly backwards. They used tobacco first, then they used a, a magnetometer and then some paper data, couldn't find it. So they came to us and said, we don't think it exists. I said, well, let's look at all the data. So we did the process from the beginning. We put everything together we could find. And then, dramatic pause, we had a lucky break. We found in the uh, Adams County records, thanks Greg Dean, uh, a lien from 1919 uh, from a, between a Mr. Luther and the Iman Oil Corporation. Now it turns out this Mr. Luther was aroused about. He was working on drilling this well, hadn't been paid all of his wages, so he put a lien on the actual rig, the well, the land, everything. And in this lien from 1919, he describes the northeast quarter, section 28. He also describes where the rig is situated, about 250 feet northeasterly from the center of the section. So we took all of this information, we put it all together, um, and we established two new search uh, polygons. Um, and we asked the uh, developer to go and search those. Again, Civitas Resources provided some help to the developer uh, for doing this. They did a, a full magnetometer survey on the, the quarter section, and they found the well in the middle of the first polygon, but note that that's almost 1,500 feet away from where we originally thought the well was. So remember, use all the data, and these older wells can be really difficult to find. Now, that leads me to where we're going. Preserving space for replugging. Why do we need to do that? Again, with the idea that we think a lot of wells are gonna need to be replugged in the future, we have to have some physical space around those plugged wells in order to get the equipment in to do the work. We're implementing a 200 foot by 200 foot uh, permanent well easement around plugged wells. The parameters there are no physical structures, no permanent physical structures, uh, access to a public road, and we work with the developers. It doesn't have to be a square, but we have to have some space. Well, let me show you why. Here's an aerial photograph of a replugging operation uh, actively happening. This space is about 220 feet by 170, so again, a little bit less than an acre. And on this space, here's some equipment that has to be set up. You've got your rig set up over the wellhead, 42 feet long, 16 feet wide when it's set up over the well. You've got your pipe racks. Those two items just by themselves are almost 100 feet end to end uh, oriented directly over the wellhead. You've got mud pumps, freshwater tanks, job site trailers, um, quite a bit of equipment. Replugging a well is not complex or complicated, but it does take a lot of equipment. 
This is why we are trying to work now to preserve space around the plug dwells. Now, how can that space be used? If it's a rural area, it can be uh, agricultural livestock. Those uses can continue with, with no disruption at all. If it's an urban area, it can be a park or an open space, even a parking lot. This picture is on the screen right there. There's actually a plugged well right in the middle of that park. You don't see it. You don't know it's there. But if we ever have to get into it to replug it, we can do that with minimal disruption to the community. Other jurisdictions are doing this as well, including Garfield County. Uh, won't go through all the details here, but just wanted to get you a sense that um, other people are looking uh, at this concept in <coughs> Colorado. So in summary, again, we believe that uh, many wells will be replugged in the future. Finding those wells can be challenging, especially when they were uh, plugged more than 50 years ago. Preserving that space around the wells is really important. And local jurisdictions have that opportunity now, before development begins to move through the areas where you have wells, um, think about what you might need to preserve. If you can set it forth an easement or something like that, um, we think that's a great idea. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, the clicker over to David, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. If